Alira. I just need to allow you to record. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in this call and welcome. Um, for those of you that might not know me, um, my name is Laura Madayo. I am the Global Channel Marketing Manager at Yamaha here in Boston. I'm a 2013 Western New England graduate. I was a sport business major, um, athletic coaching minor, actually. And I was a two-sport athlete. I played field hockey and softball and was captain of both sports. Um, as Alira maybe already touched on, I'm VP of the Alumni Association Board of Directors, um, which also means I luckily get to chair this grants committee. Um, I'm also a member of our Western New England University Women's Athletics Council as a board member. Um, so for those that might not be aware, uh, the Western New England University Grants Committee um, are grants offered by the Alumni Association to students and members of the university's community that support student programs, student organization initiatives, student ath athletics, and any other alumni association initiatives. Oh, my computer wants to restart. We're gonna postpone that. Um, since launching the program in 2007, for those that might not be aware of this, the Alumni Association has awarded 382 grants, totaling more than $550,000. We're thrilled to have four of these grantees with us tonight. So with that, I'd love to introduce our first presenter, who is Sylvia Donahue, who will be presenting on behalf of the Biomedical Engineering Society regarding their participation in the virtual BMES Fall Conference. Okay, uh, my mic's on, right? <laughs> okay, just double checking. So, let's see if this works. Okay, so the, the PowerPoint, the presentation part's gonna be a bit short because I wanna talk more about something at the end. So, let me just get, get into it after I move all this Zoom stuff around. Okay, there we go. So uh, my name is Sylvia Donahue. I'm the current acting president of the Biomedical Engineering Society here at Western New England University. And uh, this year, well, technically last year, because it's 2021 now, uh, last year uh, we had our annual biomedical engineering conference and I'll get into that right after I tell you about us, if this will go forward. There we go. So uh, bottom right, uh, you'll see our most recent event, a tie-dye event, just, uh, just to raise some um, awareness for our club and just to have some overall fun. You'll see at the table... Um, half of my e-board uh, being silly. I, lo I love them to death. And you'll also see you know, some members uh, making some tie-dye. So uh, what we do, uh, we plan various kinds of events, whether they're biomedical related or not, like with the tie-dye events. Uh, one of our last, one of our previous events with the last e-board was actually around Christmas time in, in pre-COVID, where we made some Christmas sweaters. They were really long T-shirts, but they were really cute. I don't have any pictures because I wasn't on the e-board at the time, so I apologize for that. And for. Our BME students here, uh, we help them hone in on choosing a sequence. And the BME sequences are basically like concentrations. You can be a biomedical engineer, but you need to hone in on something so you're not a jack of all trades. Now these include working in prosthetics, you can work in biomedical imaging, pharmaceuticals. Some people go into the pre-medical pre track and my tract is tissue engineering. 
And as the name suggests, you make different forms of tissues, whether it be your skin, some muscle, or bone. That was a bad idea. Ow. So we help uh, incoming BME students, whether they transfer in or uh, they're our underclassmen. And one of our big things we do is help with LinkedIn and resume building because you can never have too much resume building help. And also how to form your job application using professional language, um, who to apply to depending on your sequence and making sure it's not chicken scratch. So as I mentioned earlier, our annual conference is our big mega event. And also, unfortunately, because it was virtual, I don't have many pictures. So there's the banner. It's a really cool banner. Uh, but the main point of these annual conferences is to learn about cutting edge research from BMEs all across the country, which includes students and many PhDs. Those presentations are super cool. The first, uh, the first one I went to, it was a talk on muscle cells and just how, just how they work. And I was a sophomore at the time. I didn't know how muscle cells worked. I know how they work now because of my classes. But it was fascinating just seeing pictures of muscle, muscle cells and just the surrounding environment and just subjecting these muscle cells to different like situations through stress and major relaxation. There's a, a portion of the conference that talks about grad school programs in the presentation hall where all these student research abstracts are. And there are programs from all around the country because well, People from all around the country are there. So Cornell and Penn State are ones that I can remember off the top of my head. I can't remember more off the top of my head. My memory is not the best. So I'm going to show an example uh, of, a, of an abstract. Those of you who are here a, a bit earlier, uh, saw this. So this is a student abstract that myself, my colleague Anna, and our professor Dr. J worked on last year. And this is for a uniaxial bioreactor. Uh, normally bioreactors have two, uh, two axles. We were working on a design that only had one. And so throughout the year, me and Anna built this uh, reactor. And I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but I'm circling under the results area. We ended up calibrating it to figure out how much the motor moves uh, per rotation. And so that way we can see how the cells are affected from all the strain. To the right, you'll see some uh, some images. Uh, the top is a, excuse me. The top of this is a strain map. So as this uh, reactor is moving and putting lots of strain on the cells, that's shown over on the top right. And uh, the picture right underneath is actually a picture of the cells using a. Uh, the fluorescence and microscopy, which is actually one of the labs you take as a junior biomedical engineer. So partaking in these uh, research, it's not really a program, but I'm just going to use program because that's the only word I can think of. Uh, take part of these research programs allows uh, students such as myself and Anna to learn new techniques and apply them uh, down the road. Before this, we didn't 
know much about uh, uh, the data characterization. And after we figured out how to characterize data, we learned how to properly use uh, microscope software, as well as various forms of getting the data we needed to characterize. It was a really fun experience. I highly recommend it to everyone if an opportunity arises to participate in research to take it. It's very fun. You'll learn a lot and you can apply whatever you do uh, later on in schoolwork and just your job. I really don't have anything else. <laughs> no, thank you, Sylvia, for sharing. That was wonderful. Um, would you mind uh, unsharing your screen so that we yes. can all see each other for questions? Wonderful. Okay. So does anybody have questions for Sylvia? So I think one question I had, so what was your like favorite part about participating in the conference? You shared a lot of really wonderful pieces, but if you can hone in on one area. Oh, this is hard. <laughs> so there was this one talk on Alzheimer's and then right after in the same room, there was one on arthritis. And one of the things that was talked about in the Alzheimer's uh, presentation was a new technique using infrared lights, just transversely. So not, it's not invasive, it's just over, over your skin and just using the infrared to stimulate different parts of the brain uh, to help treat Alzheimer's and the arthritis one that one I can't really remember as much, but the main point of that one is the person presenting, their main reason for joining the research with their professor was because their family has arthritis running in it. So it was a way for the students to learn more about arthritis to help treat it for their family which I thought was awesome. That's totally awesome. Was the information available to you after the conference and is it, is it still available to your group? Yes, it's every on. I actually have the site pulled up. I don't wanna give false information, so. And it just, is it for, for the incoming group of, of you know, within, within this, um, this um, group. Uh, um, is it available for upcoming years as well? I believe so, but what you need to do is you need to be a BMES member to access the previous uh, information. So you can't pass it on from one person to another as they, as they graduate? You can if you save it, <laughs> which I'm starting to do because I think it's cool. Everyone should know it. Good. Wonderful. So any other questions before we move on? All right. Well, thank you again. Virtual round of applause. Awesome. All right. Let's see. Next, we have Aaron Whitman, who is a clinical assistant professor, who will be presenting about the Golden Bear Pharmacy Summer Camp. So welcome, Erin. Hello, and thank you for having me. I'm gonna pull this up. So a little while ago, a few years ago, uh, we had a uh, faculty member by the name of Eric Nemec who was interested in uh, holding a pharmacy summer camp for students that instead of just focusing on content, which is often what these things do, to focus on actually letting students into our space. So we let them into our lab, into our mock pharmacy, seeing the same things that our students are actually doing so that they would have a better idea of whether or not they were interested or not. Now, he did leave. And after that, I decided to take over 
And the goal for me was specifically to generate more interest in our career path in younger students in the Springfield area. Uh, because one thing that we always talk about in a lot of these graduate programs is trying to make sure that we have a good amount of diversity and not just in you know race or uh, things that we think about from day to day. We always count how many male versus female students we have, um, but there's also differences in thought process depending on where someone's from, uh, whether they're from a city or whether they're from a more rural area. And if we're able to make this program free for all students, then cost no longer becomes something that hinders the type of student that we're able to recruit. And the other thing that we've been doing is making sure that our students, our pharmacy students that we currently have, are also learning in this process. So I actually run an elective course that ends with their participation in the camp where the students actually teach parts of the sections. So teach how to do blood pressures, teach how they're counting, teach how to review a pharmacy order so that our students can learn how to work with uh, younger students and encouraging people, uh, getting out and doing community service, uh, which is really big for us in the College of Pharmacy. I'll also see in the last uh, couple of years, uh, since we've added occupational therapy, we've also added them into our program as well. Um, because sometimes we have students and they'll tell me, well, this is interesting. I'm glad I came, but I don't really think I want to be a pharmacist. And so we've been trying to make sure that we also offer some information about, well, what other careers are there in medicine that we're aware of that we could kind of lend them to and um, based on the things that they're interested in. So if they tell me like, you know, I really liked doing the blood pressures and the hands-on activity with like the fake, uh, we have a sim man uh, who you can kill repeatedly and he comes back to life. So you can make a mistake as a student and it doesn't harm anybody. Um, so they, they enjoy those things. So then maybe they're interested in being a nurse or emergency medicine. And we also try to encourage that as well. So these are examples of some of the activities that we do. Uh, so this is a student who we have working with one of our high school students, uh, teaching them what a, the different components are uh, to take a blood pressure by hand. Um, so they were able to actually practice on each other. Um, so they could see what it felt like um, to actually do it and not just watch us doing it for them. Uh, this is a, a picture of our model pharmacy that we have in, in the building. Um, so our students use this to practice how they're going to actually function in a real pharmacy. So we're not just telling them this is what you're going to see, this is what you're going to do. They're actually physically going through the motions of doing it. Uh, and our faculty member, Melissa Madison, was actually able to put in a fake script for them to do. So they were actually going through and checking this script and the students uh, in the tie-dye or our, our pharmacy students are showing them what the components are that they actually review before we give a script to a patient. Um, so what do we have to look for to make sure that it's safe for this patient to get? And you can't see, but on the other walls, it's just, it's just uh, uh, shelves of fake medication on the shelves. So the student might have to actually go to the shelf and pull the medication out. Um, it's all Skittles and M&Ms in it, but <laughs> they at least walk through the process of actually doing it and feeling what it feels like. This is an example of something that I've done with uh, Dr. Klee in the past, uh, which is the mixing of sterile products. And the beauty is that in the past, this is something we could never have done uh, with students. But now, because they have these closed system transfer devices, which does not expose the student to a needle, but allows them to draw out of a vial safely, um, we were actually able to have them do that. Um, so if you can see the little tiny red vial there, it's just food coloring, but it's to simulate a chemotherapy agent that we use that's called doxorubicin, and it's actually red. It colors fluids red as well, so you always have to warn patients that they might end up showing like tears or things red, or they might get confused. Um, and so we were able to actually show them that and allow them to draw it up and insert it into the bag uh, without ever exposing them to a needle, uh, which was really nice. And we also have this um, medicinal garden, which you can see out in the back of the pharmacy school. Um, so we, we've we used it with our own students to try to teach them some of the, the old things that used to uh, get compounded 
uh, for different disease states. Uh, and so we have uh, two faculty members who work with uh, this medicinal garden and teach our students. They have handouts in their hand, um, different pictures of things which they were able to then find in the actual garden and talk about how they're used and what they might be used for. Uh, and sometimes the students know, they're like, oh, I've heard of that before. My, my grandmother uses that for something and uh, they're able to kind of connect with it because they're physically in the garden uh, instead of us just showing them a PowerPoint of these things. And this last thing is part of the gelatoresis that happens with the DNA extraction process. And our students who are more science inclined tend to like this particular experiment working with Dr. Kinney. Uh, now, this is where you lose me a little bit. I am not an expert in DNA extraction, um, but uh, they're able to actually use the equipment here, which our faculty use. They share it with the students. Um, if there's any way where we can um, use equipment that we already have uh, to try to decrease costs. We try to do that as much as possible. And we have faculty members who volunteer their time who come in and show them how to use the equipment um, so that they can actually get a real result from their project at the end. And some things that we try to add in too are related to general health. So we talk about nutrition, uh, we do some yoga, we have some faculty members who are certified in yoga and a few other things uh, that we can do sometimes outside or inside the gym if it's um, kind of cold and rainy. Again, it's just something hands-on that the students can actually physically do. Um, I like to start the day with this because they're not going to talk to you after before a certain time of day. So if we have to start early, then I try to make sure it's something that they're physically doing, playing a game, doing yoga so that they can kind of wake up uh, before we go into the labs so that we don't have anybody make a mistake uh, and accidentally hurt themselves. So that's kind of the big things that we do. You know, all the funding that we receive are all to buy supplies for the students. As I said, I don't pay any faculty for their time. We don't buy any new equipment if we can avoid it. Uh, we try to use our resources as best as we can. Um, and our students, you know, which are also a resource that help us uh, to run this camp successfully every year. Um, we do also make sure that we provide some food for the students because, again, um, I don't want that to be a reason why students don't come. Um, so if they're having issues with transportation or food or things like that, we try to make sure that we can try to connect them to the right resource um, so that they can still come, uh, find a way for them to be able to come, even if it's just one day, um, because we don't want to turn anybody away if we can't. I forgot, I did not say, originally we had 10 students come for the camp. Um, this past year, we've actually had 50. Um, so we do some cycling where I have certain students doing certain activities on certain days. So they're not all together at the same time because uh, we only allow like 20 of them in our lab at a time. Um, but it, it's been very popular recently. Um, and now this year we're going to try to do it virtually. Um, so we're actually gonna send some materials home with the students. Uh, and now we'll be on Zoom with them, trying to show them how to do some of these things in their kitchen, uh, see how that goes. Um, but yeah, we're gonna continue to, to try to do this as best we can. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing, Erin. Now, does anybody have any questions? When do you expect to resume the in-person experience? So the thought process is to see how this virtual experience goes this year. And then maybe in order to keep the numbers of students down in the lab next year, we can do sort of a hybrid where we have some of them in person at one time and some of them virtual and then switch them. Um, so we're going to see how it goes with the virtual to see whether or not that's even an option, because if it goes horribly, then we won't do it. But that's kind of the thought process is to do a hybrid of both next year. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm curious, what um, types of things are you going to be able to send home for the kids to be doing at home versus what you might do if they were in person? Yes, certainly. So definitely there's no chemicals going home, but actually when they're in person, I never let them use chemicals anyway. Sometimes I tell them they are, but they're not. It's just normal saline or something. 
Um, but we have materials to make things like lotions and creams, uh, chapsticks, uh, things that we might do uh, in the pharmacy. Not as much nowadays, but used to. We used to make a lot of those things by hand. Um, and sending them home some actual leaves from the garden uh, so they can physically see what they look like uh, instead of just being on the picture. Um, there's some games we're going to play. So um, I'm going to have them actually pull like a cutting board and a butter knife and use it as like a counting board that you would see in a pharmacy uh, to practice doing those types of things. So we're going to do a mix of using what they should already have at home uh, and then some simple things that we can send them. So innovative and creative. That's awesome. This isn't really a question, but I found it cool that the Dini uh, Faresis was being uh, used at the camp. I had a lot of fun doing that when I was in biology, so yay. Yeah, it's definitely, if I had to pick one thing that they enjoy the most, that's definitely it because it's a long process for what they have to do. They're not used to it, um, but at the end when they actually get to see the results and um, what, what they were able to turn out, uh, they're really excited about it, so I'm, I'm glad we can do it. There was an activity we did where we for lab where we had to match up um, DNA samples to a criminal, and it was really it was really rewarding seeing that we got right using the technique. Mm -hmm. Those hands-on learning opportunities are always the best, you know. Well, wonderful. Thank you again, Arian. Virtual round of applause. Thank you. Fabulous. All right. So next up, we have Model UN. We have Caleb White, Angelina White, and their advisor, Carl Petrick, here with us tonight. Welcome. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time and uh, listening to us speak about our, our fun little club. Um, First off, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Caleb White. I am former, now former president of our Model United Nations team. Uh, I'm graduating, so we have just recently done our elections and have uh, passed on the role to Angelina, who I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, my name is Angelina White. Um, I am a political science major in the class of 2023, and I am the current president of Model United Nations. I have been a part of Model United Nations since my freshman year, so since last year, and I absolutely love every single aspect of it. Yeah, we're both uh, political nerds for sure, so this is right up our alley. Um, I'm also a poli-sci major, um, and I've been part of our Model UN team since I was a freshman as well, uh, dating back to uh, seventh grade is when I first started. So kind of giving everybody an update as to what Model UN is, because we do often get a lot of questions as to what we do. Um, our Model United Nations team is <clears throat> in acting um, as actual representatives, um, as if we were at the, you know, New York's tower um, representing a delegation. So we'll be given realistic simula simulations put together by um, chairs of different conferences, or we'll run our own simulations throughout the year. Um, our big conference that we go to, which I'll mention in just a second, is our Harvard trip. Um, it is one of the largest modern United Nations conferences in the entire world. Um, they have over 3,000 students attend it, um, with well over 80 nations represented um, around from international communities as well. So huge conference. That is what we practice for in the fall, and that is our big conference that we go to in the spring. The picture here that we have on the screen is from the 2020 uh, conference, which was uh, a month before everything was shut down. So luckily, we were able to get that one in. Um, but you can see they, they hosted at this brilliant hotel in um, right in the center of Boston. And we go and um, you work with your teams. You'll be assigned a country. So every year, our, we apply and are awarded different countries for different delegations. And each delegation has its own committee um, and problems that you have to work through by passing resolutions. You have to follow parliamentary procedures. It is as close as you can get to being on the UN floor um, without actually being on the UN floor. So lots of 
cooperation, teamwork, um, tons of skills that I'll talk about in just a second. So um, much smaller team this year, um, Harvard limited the sizes of our delegations, but we still were able to go through with it. Um, as you can see here, we were at the fourth floor of our new university commons um, with our matching pad folios, which we were all very excited about because again, we're nerds, but uh, we were virtual completely. Um, conferences still went on for four days. We went from Thursday to Sunday, um, February 14th, around that time. So um, we had a blast, I think, with everything considered. We, we were able to go on with it. Um, again, not a ton of pictures. We did manage to get this one, um, but still we're able to work with teams, work with each other, practice our skills, um, which I will actually turn over to Angelina so we can talk a little bit about you know actual what we're um, getting out of these uh, conferences. So in terms of the practical skills that we learn, um, since many professional situations um, require the defense of work and projects and ideas, Harvard National Model United Nations helps sharpen these skills so that we can uh, productively debate these pros and cons in each situation and compromise to create a productive conclusion that helps all states. We also are able to develop significant public speaking skills through our expression of plans and perspectives that would otherwise not be taken during our moderated discussions in debate. Since Model United Nations is also a very research intensive club and very research intensive in conferences, um, students are able to delve into a lot of different topics that they wouldn't be able to access otherwise or wouldn't be able to look at in their individual time or wouldn't in the long run. And they're able to use these specific issues and the information regarding the country's policy to engage in debate and then form these conclusions. Along with that, we also have the privilege of meeting people from across the world. Um, we're able to work with them through all of the working papers that we have and through the debate. And in doing that, we create an extensive network of friends and colleagues from countries all across the world. Personally, I have friends, whether it be in over social media or over Facebook or like just through text from people from Venezuela, um, Canada, all the way to um, at times in the UK. Those are very common countries that we end up seeing people from. Mm. And to build on that as well, I know I have, as um, I'm sure Angelina will find out on her own time, I've been reaching out to presidents of other conferences and other teams, not only across the country, but um, one of my closest collaborators is working out of Canada. And I uh, frequently reach out to her about, you know, what their teams are doing and um, things that we're building with them. Additionally, when they're in person, they even were able to do it a little bit this year. Um, there's uh, like almost many job fairs, especially at the Harvard um, conference, um, where international um, like teams and organizations and nonprofit organizations and governmental positions will all come and pretty much set up their booths just like a job fair and um, amazing networking opportunity. So we love bringing up our students to, to be able to do this opportunity, especially when it's in Boston, because um, there's a lot of things to take into consideration there. So having our young team get up there and start getting their names out and learning and working in these skills, because a lot of our team is poli-sci, international relations, um, just amazing opportunities for all of them. So very happy to be able to go here and we, we very much look forward to this conference every year. So. Um, love again, we love talking about it and we're more than happy to, to take any questions that might have on. Wonderful presentation. All right, questions, everybody. What country were you assigned this year? Uh, we actually had a ton this year. Um, I was on the press corps, which is like the news station for the actual conference. So I wasn't technically a country. I was a news station. Um, it was KPV, which is uh, like a Russian tabloid. So I was out and like watching conferences and writing articles on them. Um, I know we had Vietnam and Burundi, I believe, uh, were our other two delegations. Um, oh, no. um... Palau, yes, we had Palau as well. I can't remember the other one, but Palau was the um, other large one that we did have. Yeah, so it's very, very different. And you can put in, like, when you put in your applications, you can request, like, different regions of the world or different sized countries. So we were lucky to get a pretty um, diverse group for, for representation this year. 
Yeah, usually usually we have only one country. So this year they just scrambled up a bit more. Um, so we've been Portugal, uh, Czech Republic, um, Ukraine uh, for at least one bit of a conference uh, and things like that. And this year we finally had some the press corps is so cool at the face to face conference because they bust into the meetings screaming press corps, press corps and the whole like impromptu like uh, questions and then they run off and write their papers. And unfortunately, we finally got somebody in press corps and this wasn't face to face, it was virtual. <laughs> so I had to virtually bust in instead. Um, but anybody that knows Caleb knows he can talk uh, and write. So it was he was in his element for sure. Great, thank you. I'm curious, Caleb, uh, um, as you were or are searching for a job, did this is this conference recognized by employers? Yeah, um, so I have like a lot of conversations like people, um, I have an internship currently and we, I, I mentioned UN all the time and they, they know what I'm talking about for sure. Um, especially those companies that are going to the job fair, like some of the bigger ones, like Harvard's a really big one because it's international. Um, there's like some smaller ones that like um, five colleges, which is put on by UMass Amherst. Um, and like some other schools in that area um, might not be as, as well recognized, but it's certainly a talking point, especially in a field that has a lot of um, involvement with model, like with the United Nations and governmental organizations. So has so far, yeah, definitely been a talking point um, in my search. Great. Thank you. Caleb, this is a question mainly for you, I guess, but in your experience, I think you said you've been doing this since seventh grade. So I'm just curious how your experience was different in high school versus how it was more so in college. Yeah, uh, great question. I had, um, so super weird when I say this, but our model UN team was our biggest club in my high school for some random reason. Um, we had like well over 60 kids in our, in our club. Um, and we went to like a, I'd say like eight to 10 conferences a year. So it was a much larger organization. Um, so I think the biggest change was like getting used to having a smaller team and a little bit more like intimate of a team because I know everybody better. Um, and then taking on the role of president, um, it was very different in trying to, so, you know, my main goal was to like try and bolster numbers up a little bit and get people in because I'm very used to that large um, like pretty much mini conference every time our team met in high school um, to having um, a little bit of different size and numbers and different challenges. Um, pros and cons to both, but definitely um, a, a switch that I was, um, you know, had some taking getting used to for sure. Wonderful. Any other questions? Well, thank you. That was fabulous. And also congratulations, Caleb, on your upcoming graduation. Round of applause for all of it. Thank you. Fabulous. All right. And next up, we have the Alcohol and Other Drug Advisory Committee, represented by Brittany Houghton. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> So I just shared my screen with y'all. You should have that. Um, so my name is Brittany. I'm one of the residence life staff, but I serve on the Alcohol and Other Drug Advisory Committee. Um, so this is just a quick overview of what I'll cover. Um, our chair, she's not, not here obviously, but Meg Decker working out of the Counseling Center, figure I'd mention her, um, but she runs our committee. Um, um, so I'm here mostly to talk about some alcohol stuff. I've grouped a lot of my stuff um, together just to warn you all because I've done this a few years in a row, um, which we're super grateful to be able to do. Um, so thank you for that. But anyways, um, I have a few slides kind of posters for you all and I'll kind of talk you through each of the series of our um, events because it's kind of a, a compilation in a way. So this summarizes it pretty well. So we have these um, online programs to um, either measure one's alcohol use or learn about alcohol consumption. So the one we're looking at here, Alcohol EDU, that this is advertising, this is an initiative that we put together to encourage students to complete Alcohol EDU. That's the one where they learn about alcohol, its effects, um, a variety of other things. Um, we get to put some social norms marketing in there <clears throat> to educate them kind of on our campus as well. Um, but we basically do anything we can to get them to complete it um, incoming 
freshmen and as well as returning students. Um, so if they completed it by September 30th of that year, they would get put into the raffle for the iPad. And we then have events that would kind of support to advertise and push that. And so the next the next event would be mocktails. Um, and so we have had, let me see if we have mocktails. There we go. Mocktails. Um, so I don't have a picture, a great picture of this one, but it's basically where we offer a few different drinks that have no alcohol in them and a variety of handouts. Um, about alcohol consumption, including the little BAC wheels for them. Um, but we serve non-alcoholic drinks and we give them the recipe as well. But if they come to the table as well, they get another iPad raffle entry. So it's an incentive to come, get more, learn more about alcohol and other drugs, um, and also to promote the message that everybody chooses to drink or not to drink sometimes, um, just to normalize not drinking, just, um, to help support our students. I, so part of why I do this work is I work with the students in the residence halls, but I also hear judicial cases for when things happen. So they talk to me when they've gone to the hospital for you know drinking too much or not knowing how to handle eating an edible, which is um, another grant that you all have given me. We just had a program today for, um, which I hope to present on in the future. Similar to this though, we just try to give something to the students they're excited about um, so in this case, it's some kind of drink or mug um, and, you know, talk to them about alcohol, hand them resources, let them know what we have on our campus. Um, really, it's important to get them to do the alcohol EDU because it's such an important way to impact our campus in terms of students understanding how to drink effectively in terms of safety, because um, not a lot of students understand what it means to, for one serving of a drink. And that's often what I hear in my judicial cases, honestly, is they just didn't realize how much they had. Um, so it's, it's one way for us to really get that information to the students. Um, another initiative along um, after everything wraps up with the iPad and the mocktails we have is Mocktoberfest. So in October, um, we put together an event for students to come together. We give them free color changing mugs. They're super cute. Um, we put some nice marketing on there saying Mocktoberfest, sponsored by the Alumni Association and some other messaging. Um, and they come and get floats in them. And we do the same thing. We give them information about you know, um, alcohol and drug education services. Um, we talk about alcohol, we hand out um, mocktail recipes. <clears throat> so it's just kind of a fun way to engage students about a topic that they're not always talking about. Um, and so it's kind of fun when, you know, there's a res life person and a dean who are out there like, yep, let's talk about alcohol. What's a serving and how much is a serving? And we have um, on Alcohol EDU, we used to have the ability to show or do this activity where you could pour exactly one shot by holding the mouse button down. Um, so they would have, you know, a, all the different kinds of standard drinks you could go to. So we'd have a student out there doing that with the students at um, mocktails to kind of educate them on what the standard drink is. So they kind of, they start to know um, and can, you know, be safer about their consumption if they choose to. These are the mugs. Um, they're super cute. We have had some students that come back year after year to collect them. So it's kind of, now that we've done it a few years, I, I collect them as well and like have my, you know, it's, it's a nice collection. It's kind of cute to hear that students are like, oh, the color's this this year, you know. Um, but yeah, that's, I think most of the program, um, I'm sure I missed a few things because there's so many levels to it, but um, questions. This is one of the mocktail events that we had with some students helping out. How do I get my hands on a mug? <laughs> <laughs> we, we have extras. So um, if you're ever on campus, let me know and I will get you one. I'm not sure how I, I could ma mail them to you, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure we could get you one somehow. It's all those giveaways that draw students in at events, for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see, I gotta stop sharing the screen. I didn't see who had asked, so I, I'm not sure, I assumed you were off campus, but. Um. Yeah, I've been off campus for 10 years, so. <laughs> Well, next time you're on campus, let me know and we'll we'll get you a mug for sure. I can easily leave one at Res Life to have you pick up during business hours. Other questions, things you all are wondering. 
How different or challenging was it during COVID with all that? I mean, I know that for, um, I mean, you think about it, you would look at the alcohol consumption that just skyrocketed with, with people that were uh, quarantining. So just how, how different was it? And, and you know, how, how were the conversations on campus with the, uh, with the students around, just around that in general? Hmm. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I have to say we're not seeing as much alcohol use as we have in the past. Um, so I think a lot of that, personally, my opinion is that it, it comes from our rules don't really allow students much leeway. And so it, they don't, they're very pro like prote protective of what they're doing. Um, so we don't hear about too much. Um, it, numbers are really down when it comes to that stuff, <clears throat> which is interesting. Um, I will say though, since we've done this programming, I've been kind of like taking a mental note. I've been working in this role at the university for seven, going on eight years, I believe. Um, and the hope is that our alcohol consumption and challenges and all of that kind of start to go down. And what I've seen when I first got here was it was definitely a lot, it was definitely more intense. And we've really gotten to a point where students are really responsibly using or getting, you know, knowing their how to responsibly use or their peers are challenging them when they're kind of getting to that point. Um, so it's a really nice thing to see that we have fewer transports to the hospital for alcohol or other drug related things. Um, it's, I can't say I'm personally responsible for it with this program. I'd love to be able to, but you know, anything we can do to educate our students about alcohol and drugs and their impact on us is of value for sure. Um, and especially to our network and the alumni. Um, it's the more students we can keep, the, you know, the more successful they will be. So we just want to keep them here on campus successfully for their four years, hopefully, if not a little more. Um, and we hope that we do that. So, sorry, I'm extra chatty today. Other questions? Oh, that's great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Brittany, do you feel like you need more resources outside mm -hmm. what we're able to provide as a committee? I think the students need more resources in terms of counseling, um, which we actually have increased recently. Um, we actually now have a little team of not little, it's I think four or five people, but graduate students who can um, provide counseling actually the better hours too for our students. Um, so if you asked me last year, I would have said the same thing, but we've actually started to put it in place a little bit. Um, what we could, honestly, now that I think of it, what we, what we need to look at is establishing that program more because we've gotten away from alcohol EDU, which is a great tool, um, especially in judicial cases. And we haven't funded it for the past two years, I believe. So I've had to redirect people to a different resource, which is okay, but it's not as in depth and, um, you know, peer reviewed as, as well. So we do still maintain what's called alcohol um, e-checkup to go and e-toke checkup to go. They're two different systems where students can go in and kind of um, measure their own use of either alcohol or cannabis products. Um, and it helps them kind of put in perspective against their peers what their use is. But other than that, um, we need a better educational tool like alcohol ADU. Um, but it is a I think it's a lot of, it's a good number um, or a good amount of money, my apologies. Okay, that's good to know. Mm, thanks. Angelina, did you have something? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, I was wondering where these resources are available to students. The um, the the alcohol one and the, the TOC one that you were just talking about. So on counseling um, services website, you can find them through the links on there. Um, if you go into counseling, if you just search wne.edu, you'd be able to find them on there. Um, any student at any time can take them. You don't have to be told to take it or asked to. Um, but yeah, it's a free, the, those two are free tools that we do have, so. Thank you. Good question. All right, any other questions? All right, so round of applause for Brittany. Yay. Awesome. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you.
Well, everyone, that was wonderful. It's so nice to hear from you all. You all are doing wonderful, amazing work, and we look forward to hearing how things go as you move into the future. Um, are there any other questions for any of our presenters tonight while we're all together? All right. Well, everyone, stay healthy. Students, good luck with your finals. I know those are right around the corner. You're almost there. Um, and have a wonderful graduation celebration, Caleb. And thank you, Grants Committee, for being here. All right, everyone. I'm going to let you go. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you. Great job, everybody.